Shalom, and welcome to a new edition here on the Genesis 49ers page where we give thorough breakdowns and we say no to vague interpretations. Today's title is going to be a goodie. We're going to deal with Black Indians, Negro Indians of Antiquity, because whether you know it or not, a lot of the indigenous tribes before colonial times were dark-skinned people. Dark-skinned people, okay? Copper color to a very dark, Africoid, quote-unquote Africoid, if you will, skin tone. And we're going to prove that in this presentation. We're going to also prove that they exist to this day. They didn't all just die out. We still see some of those dark-skinned natives today. First slide. I have a quote here. It says, It is worthy of note that many of the Indian tribes of Brazil, when the Portuguese first came to their country, had legends to the effect that their first ancestors had come from a land in which the other inhabitants were black. So that was the legend amongst the indigenous tribes of Brazil when the, per the Portuguese first came to that to their country. Okay, and that's, that's from the Great Migration by Jeremy Fitzgerald Lee, page 64. Okay, so within their own histories, with their own, with, with the, without, out of the horse's mouth, as we say, they tell you they come from a land full of black people, dark-skinned people. What does that tell you about them? Next slide. And I'm going to show you in the Bible. The Bible says the same thing about the Israelites. Uh, preto, which means black, right? Regarding its use as a descriptive for American Indian people, European often refer to the indigenous populations of their various colonies as Negroes. For an example... In the Portuguese colony of Brazil, Indians were called Negros da Terra, meaning Negros of the land, and Africans were called Negros de Guinea, meaning Blacks of Guyana. Okay? So, when you see, and that's also, that's from the Dat the Blood Stay Pure by Otica L. Coleman. That's a real good book, page 67. So, we just read earlier that the, the ancient inhabitants of Brazil taught that they came from a land where the inhabitants were black. And we're reading here, the Portuguese called the indigenous population of the various colonies Negroes. Why? Because they're dark skinned. Some people say, oh, they would just call them Negroes because they was referencing slave. When No, they were dark skinned. They they were different shades of brown like the African. And that's another thing. Dark skin doesn't mean uh, um, Wesley Snipes black or night black a night shade of black no dark skin means brown okay people play semantics but we can clearly see with these two quotes that the original inhabitants of brazil were dark skin next slide now we're going to deal we dealt with brazil and the, the ancient inhabitants there and in their um history and their ancestry going into their black, you know, dark skin history. Now we're going to deal with Puerto Rico and the Hibaros, right? Thus, the Mestizo Indians survived in large numbers and more importantly maintained a cultural consciousness. As Spanish population census imply and dialectic would explain, they and many of their full-blooded kin were present throughout the mountain regions and other places of the island at the end of, 18th, of the 18th century. That's from the myth of Caribbean extinction by Tony Cast Castanha, page 68. Also another great book smashing that, that myth because they're trying to say, oh, there's no indigenous people. They still teach that in 2017, which is sad, which is very sad. Okay, but you can clearly see at the end of the 18th century, they still have full blood kin, these Hibaros, right? And what they would do, I'm going to do a separate video on this, but I'm going to touch on it briefly. What they would do to try to say that the Indians were extinct, they would only 
do a census for the Indians for the, the uh, cities. Like, for example, in Puerto Rico, they will only do a census for the Indians there in San Juan. And they wouldn't count the ones that were dark-skinned. They would just call those, oh, those are Negroes. So it made the numbers of the Indians, you know, dwindle. And they wouldn't count the ones that lived in the mountains and the ones that didn't live in the major cities. So that, that's where that myth comes from. This is what this whole book is about. Following slide. Um, more information about the Hibaros. Mesaje is a powerful force of exclusion of both black and indigenous communities in America today. As a con consequence, a bl black and indigenous awareness of exclusion and continuous struggle for ethnic power will remain prominent. And that, that, that goes directly against Tariq Nasheed and uh, many of his colleagues and his cohorts because... Again, it says a continuing struggle for ethnic power will remain prominent. Black and the indigenous communities, what we call black and what we know as indigenous, we have to combine our efforts in order to be successful, to become a power, to become, you know, a government. We have to come together. Black and Latin and indigenous people, okay, we have to come together. And that's evident. Read on. These processes are especially evident in the largest Vestige of United States colonialism in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricoños, clearly regard their island as a nación and are as nationalists about their identity as are Colombians, Ecuadorians, Venezuelans, Jamaicans, Cubans, or Haitians. Emergent Puerto Rican uh, nationalism under Spanish rule embraced the ideology of mestizaje, in which the Hibaro, which they call Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rican peasants was the bearer of a nascent Puerto Rican identity and culture. The mixture emphasized Spanish indigenous heritage with privilege according to the former. Although in many areas, here it is, here it comes, he borrows very in skin color from brown to black. Why? They were dwelling in those mountains. How did they get in those mountains? Fleeing uh, colonialism. Okay, they were hiding in the mountains where the Spaniards could get them and they stayed there for ever since they, the Spaniards came to the island. Hundreds and hundreds of years. That's why they call them peasants, because they became mountain dwellers, farmers, and, and, and so, so on and so forth. They had to live in the mountains. But the point I want to bring out, although in many areas, Hibaros vary in skin color from brown to black, there's little, if any, national emphasis on the African component of Puerto Rican heritage. What they call African is the skin color. But we know the indigenous people were originally a brown and dark-skinned people. The 1898 invasion by U.S. troops and subsequent enforced segregation gave impetus to the nationalist ideology of the Mestaje and especially to its dimension and blanqueamiento. This was further reinforced by the view that the partnerless social order of the plantation contributed to the racial integration. So they forced themselves, okay, the, the Esau forced themselves in 1898 onto these people and started trying to integrate and mix with them these dark-skinned hibaros. Today, black Puerto Ricans who have maintained their autonomy since the formation of the maroon groupings on the island, are, and that it goes back to the history of them resisting the colonials, fighting against them, and going and fleeing and seeking refuge in the mountains of Port, Puerto Rico, are the challenge and official interpretation of Puerto Rico's ethnic heritage. Migration to and from mainland United States has intensified the multifaceted debate by infusing it with features of the U.S. black empowerment. And the official U.S. categorization of Puerto Ricans as minorities and people of color. Of color. Why? Because they know that that background goes back to the indigenous people, the indigenous people being dark-skinned, okay, originally. And that's from Africana by Henry Louis Gates Jr., page 517. I plan on getting this whole collection from him and the other authors that contributed because there's a lot of jewels in here. I know it's very expensive, but I need this book so I can uh, cover more information about this topic and other topics as well and provide it to the people, to the viewer, you at home, you brothers and sisters. So you can clearly see that the Habaro or what we call quote-unquote black. Next slide. Let's deal with the mosquito, the mosquito entities. More than 90% of Nicaragua's population live in the western portion of the country and are descended from the Spaniards, who first settled the area in 1524 and ruled until 1821. 
Most Nicaraguans are mestizos of mixed Spanish and Indian ancestry. See, that's the thing. When they say mestizo, they always say, oh, descended from the Spanish. That doesn't mean automatically descended from the Spanish. That, that doesn't mean there's a mix there. But they always, oh, that's white supremacy right there. That's how you whitewash history. Oh, it's just only Spanish. But we're going to go on. But approximately six, 60,000 Mosquito Indians never assimilated. I'm going to read that again. But approximately 60,000 Mosquito Indians never assimilated into the Spanish society of the West. Live on the East Coast along with several thousand other Indians and Caribbean blacks. Spain, which periodically came over the mountains and through the jungles to what became known as Mosquito Coast, never fully succeeded in conquering the Indians. Let me read that again, because you're not going to hear this in mainstream media education, okay? No one's going to touch on this. Spain, which periodically came over the mountains and through the jungles to what become, became known as the Mosquito Coast, never fully succeeded in conquering the Indians. Meaning what? There's still pure-blooded blood, Indians living in Mesoamerica, living in the Caribbean. There's still full-blooded Indians. Stop listening to what, what white supremacy teaches us, that all Native Indians are extinct. All of them are killed off. There's no pure-bred pure, pure Native Indians. We're going to show you a picture of how these Native Indians look, these Mosquito Indians look, okay, which are the Israelites that the Bible speaks of. If the eastern part of Nicaragua acknowledged any colonial power, it was in England, which traded and pirated along the east, east coast, never Spain. The word for Spain in Mosquito language is the same word for enemy. Let me read that part again. The word for Spaniard in Mosquito language is the same as the word for enemy. So they hated and despised them. The Spaniards, the, the colonizers, and they stayed away from them, proving that there, there's a pure breed of native Indians. Okay, there's a high, like in Honduras, there's a high, high percentage of native Indians. There's a high percentage in Mexico, I think, I believe it's 30%, because they know the history. But they, they know the truth, but they'll tell you, they'll teach your children in school, all oh, the native Indians went extinct. I was listening to a, because uh, I'm learning, I'm trying to perfect my Spanish. I was listening to a Spanish, a Spanish uh, podcast, and the man, he pushed that in 2016, last year. He pushed that notion that, no, no Native Indian tribe exists. Uh, no, they only exist culturally. We, we practice their cultures. No, they, they exist. Okay, and guess what? They were dark-skinned. That's what we're going to get to. And that's from Where is Nicaragua by Peter Davis, page 44. Right? Okay, I got to touch on another thing. They know the truth because who's writing these books? Who's compiling these books? A lot of their people are writing and compiling these books with this information. They refuse to teach it. But that's okay. That's what Genesis 49, 49ers is here for, to teach the people, okay? You're going to get unadulterated truth here on my channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I'm going to provide more and more educational videos, uplifting videos, and enlightening videos. Next slide. These are the Mosquito Indians. Now, a lot of a lot of people say, oh, they mess with Afrikoid people. No, they always had a dark skin, and a lot of them had woolly hair, okay? The proof of that is what we've been reading this whole time about the indigenous tribes, okay? Brazil brought out that they came from a land of blacks. The Portuguese called them Negroes. So we can clearly see the distinction, Okay? These are the Mosquito Indians. And that's how they, that's how they take, rob you of your inheritance and rob you who you are. They say, oh, you're just from Africa. They use that on all of us. They use it on the, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. They use it on the, the quote-unquote indigenous community. They use it on African Americans. Oh, you're just from Africa. It robs you of your, hist your, your history, your land, your rights. Because you are Israelites and you came over here and discovered this land. 2,000 years before Columbus. Okay? So the Mosquito Indians right here. Dark-skinned, woolly-haired people. Okay? Following slide. Now, let's deal with Mexico. Let's deal with Mexico. We dealt with the Brazilian Indians. He borrows the mosquitoes now. Let's deal with... Tarahumara, the Tarahumara Indians in Mexico. 
It says of, of effective Spanish penetration to the most inaccessible mountain canyons because they these people in ancient time, well, four five hundred years ago, fled to the mountains to flee colonialism, to flee the conquistadors. It says even here, however, they took their sheep and cattle to provide wool hides and manure for cultivation. No area of the Tarahumara matter therefore remained untouched by Spanish civilization, quote unquote, but at least part managed to preserve preserve certain cultural practices that distinguish it more clearly from the non Indian society. Nevertheless, these least occulted Tarahumaras did not conserve an undisputed ethnic purity. They tended to absorb through intermarriage other Indian groups who fled the Spanish in Sonora and Sinaloa. Pimas and Hovas, for example, to refuge of the Sierra. So that's what they were doing. They were refuging in the mountains. These Tarahumaras also accepted and mixed with marginal mestizos and mulattoes, perhaps acquiring geopolitical knowledge that helped them preserve autonomy. Tarahumaras in particular have been able to preserve cultural integ integrity in direct proportion to their ability to flee. And certain Tarahumara's communities seem to have had the cohesion to resist as whole entities. By the time of Tarahumara's rebellions of the 1690s, tribal differences concerning acceptance or of our resistance to outsiders were not entered within communities. I mean, not centered within communities. Instead, the dividing lines separated entire rancherias from one another. With those on the most isolated northwestern corner of Tarahumara country leading the resistance, the upper Tarahumara Indians found another outlet for their hostility to the Spanish in the late 18th century. Because of demographic pressures in the plains areas of the United States, Apache Indians were being pushed southwest and were successful in conducting raids on Spanish farms and livestock as far as the Durango. The rugged mountain mountainous terrain of western chihuahua provided sanctuary as well as tarahumara recruits for the apache raiding activities so the tarahumara and the apache joined together to the right you see a picture of the tarahumara of mexico what color are they dark skin right why because they pres they were preserved in these mountains okay they fled from the conquistadors okay this whole time been hiding in the mountains. You can see that they're they are dark skinned people. And that source is from the New Latin American Mission History by Eric Langer Langer, page ninety eight. So don't let nobody tell you there's no pure Indian. They're all mixed. Blah blah blah. The same rhetoric we always been we always been force fed since we since we started going to school, since we started learning about anything. They tried to make Make it seem like we're, not, we're, and that goes back to the scripture that Ephraim will be broken that they're not a people, you know. And that's exactly how they look at the Northern King. They look at them like they're not a people. They don't exist. They just don't exist. You know, they're nobody. The New Latin American Mission History by Eric Langer, page ninety-eight to the right. You can clearly see the dark skin Indios. Okay, you can clearly see them right. Here. These are the Tarahumara quote-unquote Indians, because Indian means servant, right? That's what it means. That's how East Indian got their name. It used to be Persia. The name we call East India after the uh, the Greeks came and conquered. Next slide. Because if you don't know, India became a vassal state to Greece. But here it is, dark. Qu quarterly, volume 10 through 16, um... Los Angeles County Museum, 1953. It says pine log trim by the Tarahumaris in Tarahumara Log House. Of the tar Tarahumaris are offered. Skin color is usually dark brown with fewer individuals of yellowish brown tints and occasional skin color similar to that of the Caucasians. So majority of them are dark brown. Let you know what? That wasn't much mixing amongst the Tarahumaras and the Spanish. Why? Because they were fleeing and they were fighting the Spanish. They joined forces with the Apache and fought the Spanish and hid in the mountains of northwest Mexico. And that's what preserved them to be dark skinned. They, they, they look like their forefathers, their ancestors. Because if you look at the Aztec paintings, you look at the, the murals of Bonham Peck, right? The different codexes, you see a lot of dark skinned figures on, on, the, on the codexes and the drawings of the Aztec and Mayan people. 
Those were the representatives of their nation. Those were their ancestors. They were drawn themselves. Okay? Even the meeting between Hernan Cortez and the Aztecs and Juan Garrido. You see Juan Garrido is very dark. Okay? And he's standing right back behind Hernan. And I always stick to the opinion that he was his interpreter. Why was he so close to Hernan when he was meeting the Aztecs? And you see the Aztecs being dark brown skinned people. This stuff's not hard to find. But you can see the Tatarahumata people are dark skinned. They preserve. They are preserved. Next slide. The attire and physical appearance of the Tatarahumatas are characteristic, and their skin is darker than that of the mestizos. Let me read that again. The Tatarahumata are characteristic, and their skin is darker than that of the mestizos. They typically typically wear garments wear colorful garments, excuse me. A Tatarahumata man often is observed with his hands behind his back, walking several feet behind his wife, whose waddling gait is amplified by the swinging of several skirts. She wears one on top of the other according to their custom. Anthropologists have relied on the appearance and anthropometric indices to characterize the group. Vivo classified the Ra Rara Muri among the su sub Dolico phallus having head longer than wide of tall stature group groups of North Mexico. In colonial days, Roque described the Tahramoradas of the Karachi as follows. As a rule, they are dark in color, almost black. They have sparkling eyes and almost all of them are strong and healthy of body. One sees only a few who are by nature lame, blind, deaf, or dumb. And that goes back to the scripture in, in uh, I believe, what is it, Exodus? There was no feeble person among them when we was entering into the promised land. And that goes back to that. There's no feeble. There was, you know, rare to see feeble people amongst these people. They have sparkling eyes. and Almost all of them are strong and healthy of body. Only sees only a few who are by nature lame, blind, deaf, or dumb. Those who are thus afflicted become so only through some accident. Father Newman, Rock K. Contemporary, noted that these people are swarthy of color, but not black. And what? We'll, that goes back to black as in like African black, dark, dark black. Or what we what we know is that because even within the quote unquote African rim, there's different shades of brown. Not every one of them looks like Wesley Snipe or have a dark shade. Lumholtz observed that the Tatarahumatas are more muscular than their North American cousins and their skin color is light chocolate brown. Uh, the darkest complexions, see, this 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 cuts what he said they're not but not black. It says the darkest complexions are seen in the highlands near Guachochi. In the high altitudes, the people also develop higher statues and are mus more muscular than the lower portions of the country. So I want to touch on this. It says these people are swarthy. Swarthy means black. It just means black. That's what it comes from. Swart meaning black. Okay. That's what also a steward means. So, but you can clearly see the contrast between these two ta ta the Tarahumara Indians and this woman here, she's a quote-unquote Caucasian. Look at their skin and then look at hers. Complete different. These people were, were preserved because they fled in the mountains from the Spanish conquistadors. They look closer to their forefathers. That's why I, the first thing was we read was the Tahoe Monos are characteristic and their skin is darker than that of the Mestizos. Right? These are the ones that were preserved. So don't let nobody tell nobody all the Indians were just wiped out and there's no pure. Get out of here. Mexico has 30%. Even within their, their you know, their census, 30% of, of Mexico's population is uh, indigenous. Next slide. Eskimos. At least the Eskimos with their medium dark skin are an exception. Wait, did I give y'all, give you brothers the uh, source? Oh, the source for that. Last one, forgive me for this. Tahumura Medicine by Fractuoso Irohien Rascon. Okay, Eskimos. At least the Eskimos with their medium dark skin are an exception from the noted correlation between pigmentation pigmentation and equatorial latitudes. Loomis, 1967. Yeah, that's right, because equatorial latitudes don't determine skin color. Now, with melanated people in a, in a hotter region, you could get darker because that's how melanin works. 
the vitamin D goes into your skin, your melanin reacts to the sunlight, and, and, it, and it can get darker. You know, that is true, but it doesn't mean you can take a Caucasian and put him in the equator for 500 years and he's going to get dark. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen like that. And that's why you see Esmo, they are dark skinned, but they live in, in the colder regions. So that that science is wrong. That theory is wrong. It's wrong. Right? You know, you had uh you wouldn't have all these light skinned people living on the coast like the, the uh Cape Verdeans, right? If this was true. Okay, they should be darker than what they are. But I digress, that's not a part of this uh lesson, just had to touch on that for a minute, but the Eskimos are dark skinned nonetheless. That's from Human Biology of Circumpolar Populations by F. A. Milan, page 139. And, and I have a note here. It says, Ice nigger is a derogatory term denoting Eskimos. And I noticed that I was watching a TV show about like seven years ago, and the guy had a tall Native Indian with him. It was just eat a mic. It was a white guy. It's a quote unquote white guy. And they were traveling somewhere in Canada. And they went to a grocery store or, or, or a gas station. And he, he called him an igloo nigger. Right there on TV. I, that, I was so fascinated by that. Like, what did he just call him? He called him an igloo nigger. And the native Indian, he was like six foot five or something. Knocked him out and walked out. And I was like, oh, so they, they called them niggers too. But, you know, I did research on it. And they called him ice nigger. Uh, if you feel like that word... It, you know, offend you, you know, you can skip this part, but I'm using that word, that term for uh, educational purposes to show that they use the same word for them as well, the Eskimos, because of that dark skin. So we're getting to the end of the presentation. Uh -oh. We're at the end of the presentation. Uh, and we touched the Negros da Tara, meaning the, the blacks of the land in Brazil. We touched the Hibaros, which is dealing with the Puerto Rico Puerto Ricans. We deal with the Mosquito Indians. Okay, that's the lower region of Mesoamerica, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Tarahumara, Northwest Mexico. And then we deal with the Eskimo, which is, you know, Canada. You know, kudos to, to the Canadian Native Americans because... At least the Canadian government government named them um, First Nationers instead of Indians. That so, you know, I'm happy that they they're not getting that oppressive name put on them. And I know I use it a lot, but I use it for you know recognizable purposes so you can recognize who I'm talking about. But uh, one last scripture, and you get to to the right, Bonapac, Mexico. This mural of these dark skinned ancient Mexicans. These are the progenitors of your um, quote-unquote indigenous Mexican groups, okay? These are the progenitors. They come from a dark-skinned people. So the ancient Brazilian Indians were right. What we read earlier. Final slide. Cushy. Amos 9, verse 7. I know a lot of my viewers may be familiar with this scripture. If not... You're going to be familiar with it because I'm going to be bringing it up in a lot of my videos. Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, children of Israel? What is this? When you go into the history, when you go into Genesis, where did Abraham come from? Era of the Chaldees. That that was an, a land um, belonging to the quote unquote Ethiopians or the Cushites, right? So we come from a black land where, where other black people were. The, and the, guess what? The Shemites were black as well, said the Lord. Have not I brought up Israel in the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Cap uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt, another black land. Philistines from Captain, another black nation, and Syria from Kerr. Right? So, are you not as the children of Ethiopians unto me? Yes, the original Israelites were. In fact, Negroid. The original indigenous people were, in fact, Negroid, dark-skinned people. Okay? The Israelites derived from a black nation of antiquity. So with that, I'm praying that this lesson was a very insightful lesson. I'm praying that you learned a lot. You took notes. I'm praying that you spread this video. You share it on the social media platforms. Like, comment, and subscribe. Like, comment, and subscribe. Genesis 49ers. 
we will continue to provide content, continue to provide educational, insightful, and uplifting content for, for the viewers, for the brothers and sisters out there that we may learn and grow together and that we may spread this gospel and the good news and wake up the 12 tribes of Israel. That is the end goal. With that, I'm going to say shalom.